Hello everybody, welcome back to Slope Talk. We have not done one of these in quite a while. So this if this is your first time joining, the whole point of these is to uh, really sort of share the enthusiasm, the passion for winter sports with other like-minded people within that industry. This could be anything from people that run businesses, people who have worked seasons or, or, or have built full-time lives in the mountains, and then people who like building content around uh, the sports. And, and, and today I'm going to be having on someone who uh, has been a guest on this channel before. I'm really excited to have him back on. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about um, his experiences from last winter. He went on some pretty uh, unique trips and uh, the content he's produced on his channel on that has been pretty awesome to, to experience. We're also then going to have a bit of a look ahead to this winter, which is fast approaching here in Revelstoke. It's about 83 days to go now until next winter. Um, and uh, yeah, the days over here are getting a little bit uh, shorter and cooler also. So yeah, bring on winter 2022-23 and let's bring in uh, today's guest. So I'm delighted to welcome back to the show, Simon Burgess. Hey Matt, how are you doing? I'm well, thanks Simon. How are you? Yeah, good. Thanks for having me back on. Uh, I was just, just saying, like, I'm so excited to just talk skiing again. It feels like the summer has been long uh, and I can't wait. Yeah, um, I've, I've, I've definitely had my fill of, of like summer as a whole. Um, it, out here, it's kind of been all, all right. We've not been too bad with wildfires, but, but just generally like last couple of weeks hiking up on the mountain and you look at the lift and you go, oh, ready, ready to actually put the skis to the powder and get out there. It's a weird time to be in a ski resort, isn't it? Shoulder season, because um, from the ski resorts that I've been in, uh, like take some peaks, for example, the, the summers are still busy. So mm. you've got like mountain biking, etc., And then that kind of dies off a little bit. And there's just this little weight in town and like a bit of expectation for what's coming. So I'm assuming that's what Revy's like at the moment. Definitely. It's, it's, it's since sort of after August, we, we, it's now starting to taper off a bit. Um, reduced hours on the mountain. And um, yeah, we close up actually for the summer season on the 25th. So then shoulder season will really kick in at the end of this month and into October where there'll be this little lull. There'll be sort of the, the permanent residents still hanging around. And then out of nowhere, all the new seasonal workers will come into town um, yeah, the vibe for the winter will really start to pick up. Um, by all accounts, I mean, I'm no meteorologist, but everybody's been saying that the outlook for this winter is looking good. So fingers crossed for another for another powder, a powdery winter here in Revy. So is, for, from a summer point of view, what yeah. is Revelstoke? Is it, a, is it a mountain biking resort or...? Uh, definitely on the mountain. It's very much a, 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 a biker's bikers uh, place um we have actually one of the very few roller coasters across like all of i think sort of northwest america i i might be wrong on this but i certainly know for the last couple of years we've been the only one on sort of the west of canada although i think they've they've just started building one in red deer possibly in alberta but it's that, that like, like a toboggan map like, like the um like alpine the, coaster yeah yeah, okay. those which cool. are like you know in every resort in Switzerland and Austria in the summer, mm. but out here it's it's just like a, a revelation to a lot of people, and it's it's done wonders for the town. It, it brings a lot of people off the highway, so you get a lot of people doing these sort of four five hour road trips between Alberta and Vancouver, and um, yeah, they stop off and you know they flood to this thing. Um, they're building a second one right now, which may be completed by the end of this year, but. No, those are the two main things. There are some hiking trails um, on the, 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 the resort. Um, lots of other hiking trails, though, in Rogers Pass, which is a beautiful place to go and, and check out in the summertime. Water sports, very popular out on the above the dam. So a lot of paddle boarding, kayaking, um, jet skiing. Yeah, it, it's, it's amazing how much actually the little town has. That's so cool. Like, I think if you, and you're doing it now, like you're basing yourself in one place. If you've got 
a year round kind of schedule like that you know you've got the winter sports and then you can go into these um like the paddle sports and even just uh, getting out on a mountain bike that's a good mm. year man yeah yeah it is it, it, it's definitely really working it's developing well into a all-round year destination and it's it, revy still has this really nice small town vibe with a community that that makes everyone from all these different cultures and backgrounds feel included um it, it's certainly i mean i've never been there but all the the feedback i get from big places like a whistler or a veil i just you know, the enjoyment, I think, has worn off for a lot of people who live and or work in those parts. But yeah, Revy, Revy is still going strong. So it's, um, it's well, but um, so, sometimes places can get too big, can't they? Like I know, um, so Sun Peaks is the second largest ski resort in Canada. Mm. And it was really quiet. And I haven't been to Whistler during the winter. Um, I was actually hoping to go this coming winter, but more about that later. But yeah. in the summer, it it's hectic and for me that's quite a turn off a lot of time when i'm choosing somewhere to go yeah because you because you did a season in sun peaks didn't you yeah so I taught in sun peaks for a season um and it to me it's a really nice resort there's there's a lot of um like the village is kind of uh manufactured european mountain village life which yeah. you can either take it or like coming from europe it seems a bit false um mm. But actually, the ski resort itself is is a really nice, and you don't get crowds. Um, no. Maybe a couple of weekends, is it President's Weekend or or whatever? You might queue for about ten minutes. But besides from that, um, it, it's great. Yeah, yeah, really blew my mind. Like like you say that that European style that the town is actually built in, but the the terrain was just just incredible. Um, and uh, yeah, it was so so weird that when I when I sort of went there, and like a few days later, you you piped up, and I had I had no idea that you'd gone there. Did you do the the what was it the Burfield chair? It takes like twenty six minutes, I want to say, maybe even longer. If it's the very very slow one where there's a little bit of a connection, yeah, it, it, it did. It, it reminded me of sort of catching a, a lift in France from a from a resort where there was no snow at the bottom of it and you had to sort of ride that chair going through like mud on the bottom to yeah. get to the top because it was yeah um yeah I think I must have listened to about six Beatles songs on that <laughs> for the duration of that that chairlift I think so that chairlift is the closest chairlift to where the staff accommodation is at Sun Peaks. Okay. And it probably tells you something that nobody takes that chair. They'll either yeah. walk into the main village or obviously like catch the bus or whatever. Yeah. Um, whereas you'd think if there's a chairlift right outside where you're staying, you, you would get on it. But some of the terrain under there though, in the right conditions is unbelievable. And, and because the chair is so slow, people don't go over there. Yeah. Um, so I love that area. And also on the other, uh, one of the other mountains at some peaks, Morrissey, um, you just got the place to yourself when the mm. rest of the resort, when the rest of the resort is a bit busier. Um, and yeah. if you head over to Morrissey side. I, I just, I mean, I know it was the end of the season, but I was really taken aback by how, how well maintained the resort was, all the pieces were, were, were groomed immaculately. And there was just, there was just so much like, to actually ski um yeah it was yeah it was i was a really really impressed with that resort um but mate how, how how has your summer been tell us a bit about that uh yeah so it's been pretty good uh very busy so i, I think well you'll know and if people saw me on here last time they'll know that i'm a, a school teacher so we get um six weeks but um this summer I actually took um, students to borneo for four of those weeks so oh, nice. we did yeah, it, it was beautiful, um, completely opposite to what I would normally do, because normally I would try and find somewhere um, to go skiing. But um, yeah, we went, built some uh, community centers and did some wildlife conservation and then just a bit of travel as well. So um, I don't I don't necessarily feel rested, uh, but it was it was such a cool experience and the students were amazing on it. They were no hassle whatsoever and we just kicked back in these amazing islands and just be very thankful to have the opportunity to go there. Wait, did you say Borneo or Bormio? I, I'm th I keep thinking about, isn't there a ski resort in Italy called Bormio? There is a ski resort in Italy called Bormio, but I was in Borneo, ah. uh, which is Indonesia. 
So uh -huh. I think the main main draw for a lot of the students was the orangutans and um, there was like a, a paddy diving course where they got to go out and see like manatees or stingrays and um, yeah, it was pretty cool. Oh, okay. But uh, yeah, no, no, no ski hills in Indonesia. Sadly not, no. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one of the, one of the sort of the, the, the big topics that I wanted to discuss today was your, your, your big trip, your, your, your journey through, through Switzerland last winter um, on something called the, the Magic Pass. Um, I guess like to, to, to sort of kick us off on this one, really, did you want to just explain briefly what the trip was all about? Yeah, so the way that, and for people who've seen my channel or follow me on socials, I always try to ski as much as possible for as cheap as possible. Now, that's not necessarily always at like the sacrifice of going to good resorts. And I was looking for multi-resort lift passes that would allow me to go lots of different places, uh, hopefully on a little bit of a road trip. Um, and I came across this one called the Magic Pass. Now, i I've used a lot of multi-resort passes um, when skiing, and I don't actually think there's a better value one than the Magic Pass. Um, and it's actually got better value this year. So if, if you were going to go out this year, they've added some more resorts. Um, mm -hmm. But it's 399 Swiss francs if you buy it before the season in May. And then as the summer goes on, they actually increase um, the cost of the pass. Uh, so 399 Swiss francs is about 350, 360 pounds. I've, I've just, I've just Googled that then when you, when you've said it, that's like, that's, that's really affordable. And what, what, what does, what does that pass give you then? So it gives you summer and winter access to a number of resorts across Switzerland. Now, I think this year there's 52 resorts, 51 of which are in Switzerland and one is in France um you get loads of little cool resorts um so for example and i'm sorry because i'm going to butcher the names of some of these resorts um but one of my favorites was a place uh, near Laison called la lecherette and again it was just um drag lifts but not that many people away from the crowds and um you can definitely go right two or three days there absolutely perfect on to the next place um, so that's what the Magic Pass was really good for. And, and the trip in total was about eight weeks. Um, and I think I tried to add it up earlier and I've probably forgot one, but I think I went to 17 of the resorts um, during the time there. I was going to say, like, I mean, I, I've, I've been re-watching some of the videos from, from your trip over the, the last couple of days. And I think all in all, you probably did about, what, 20-odd 20, 20 odd videos. So you were you were really smashing out the content. And to be honest, that, that there's more. I've still sat on my desk on my hard drive. I just because of the summer that I've had, and after the end of the season being so busy, I haven't been able to sit and do it. So that is that is my goal. I'm saying it here on camera. So within the next week or so, I will start sitting down again and start editing, um, because there's some beautiful resorts that I haven't even had the chance to to like speak about or show you yet. Like um, went to uh, Verkorin. I was really lucky to be like. Um, the guest of the Val de Anivers, um, Val de Anivier, God, I'm butchering everything here. Um, their tourist board, they put me in a really nice hotel at the bottom of the slope. And I'm not just saying it because they did that, but the resort, it's it's up the road from one of my favorites on the trip, Grimentz. And okay. um, I think 20 minutes, 15 minutes in the car from Grimentz, but there's this quiet little ski resort, Ver Verkarin, and it was absolutely gorgeous. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to bringing those videos out soon, hopefully. Yeah, de definitely, mate. I'm all, we, I, think, I think we're all hungry for, for, for ski content now as we look towards the winter. And yeah, if you've, you've still got stuff like left over from that, by all means, get it out, mate. I'm, I, I myself, I want to see it. Um, but um, I, now I've, I've only skied Switzerland twice. I've done it, done it in October in Sasfe, which I know is one of the trips you did. I did it there for a bit of race training years ago. But beyond that, I don't really know a lot about Switzerland as a ski destination. So could, could you tell us a bit about the country? Uh, so let's get the, um, the main thing out of the way. Despite the cheap pass of the Magic Pass, skiing in Switzerland in general is not cheap. Okay. Um, so 
I was able to find places to stay because I had a car that might have been a little bit further out of the ski resorts. Mm. So, I mean, you mentioned Sass Fay. So I stayed in Sass Grund, which is underneath Sass Fay, and I would either um, take the bus up because Sass Fay is a um, car-free ski resort. Um, or um, in the case of when I went to Anzair, I stayed in like a village at the bottom and I would drive up and there's free parking in the ski resort. So there's definitely ways to make it affordable. Um, but just in general, it's not affordable as as a destination. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the, the lift pass helps. In terms of the, the, the skiing there, there is so much on offer from, as mentioned already, kind of your, your small resorts um, where you can get away from crowds and then big name skiing, big mountain skiing. Um, and I will be the one trip that I've booked for this coming winter is also in Switzerland so far. Um, so it's it's somewhere that I really like. And if you don't want to take the car, traveling around it on train, so easy. Yeah. Um, so I think at, at um, Easter, uh, I'm going to head to Andermatt and uh, I'm probably going to do um, a fair amount of that journey on the train. I'm going to ask you more about winter 22, 23 a little later on, because um, that, sound, that sounds awesome in itself. Um, um, how did you find the ski terrain in Switzerland? So varied. And it, honestly, it just depends on... Um, what you're looking for, your ability, that the Magic Pass itself has everything. So if you want a, a beginner's resort without a lot of crowds, you can do that. If you want to go for something more challenging, like Sass Fay has got um, a run from um, the top of the glacier all the way down to the base. I think non-stop leg burner, I think I put a video out, it's maybe like 12 minutes or something, um, and you take in some some nice uh some nice black terrain and some beautiful red runs i think switzerland the amount of resorts that they have um comparable to france comparable to um you know the us and canada you're going to be able to find something for everyone yeah okay um conditions now when you were there it did seem very blue a lot of blue sky um not and looking at a lot of the resorts either side of the piece there didn't seem too much snow would that be fair uh yes so it's a bit of a weird one so uh my favorite place happened to um coincide with best conditions who'd have thought um but grement zinal um they're well known for for like good snowfall and they delivered a lot of the other resorts, I think they were just having a lean year. So they did a great job of actually the piece, absolutely fine. But either side of it, you were looking at brown mud, rocks. Yeah. Um, and it last winter in Switzerland probably wasn't the, the one to judge it off, to be honest. Mm. When did you go, by the way? What time of the year? So that was January, February. So okay. by the time, I think February was by far the best conditions of the trip. Mm. Um and it's about choosing those resorts really wisely now for me i wanted to see as many of the resorts as i could in the time period which actually did mean take Les Charette that i've already mentioned um that's quite low so the conditions either side of the piece there are not going to be as good as if you were going to sas Fay, which is high and has a glacier mm. so um if I was just aiming to get the best conditions on every single day, then I probably could have been a bit smarter with it. Um, mm-hmm. Similar with, at the end of the trip, I went to um, Diablare, Villars, Grion, and Glacier 3000. Obviously, the conditions on the glacier, the conditions in Diablare were, were really nice. When you got lower down into resorts like Grion, that's when you were, you were seeing a lot of rocks and stuff popping up. Yeah, okay. Um... I mean, I know that you, you you sort of you actively have sort of gone and chosen one or two of the maybe the the less well known ones, more sort of the quirkier resorts. Um, but just like from looking at all those videos, I mean, it seemed like most of the part you had some of those resorts to yourself. Like, I, I, like you could count on your finger maybe how some of the people were there. Like, it, was it that quiet? Uh, yeah, it was. And I, f- I don't know if that's a normal thing. It was a weird year to go in, right? So I think when I left the UK, the day that I left, the French government had just said, if you're not on the train by midnight, so it took uh, Le Chateau, 
um, from Folkestone over to Calais. Mm. And they basically said, if you're not on by midnight, you're not getting on. And they were having a like a, a mini lockdown. If you were in, you were fine. Uh, and then yeah. you were allowed to travel on into Switzerland. So you're allowed 24 hours to, to basically drive through France. Yeah. Um, so that would have had an impact at the start. Um, now, towards the end of the trip, when everything was open again, resorts like Diableray were really busy. I think Diableray, Villars and Grion were probably amongst um, the, the, the busiest of them. But there was always somewhere that you could have gone to avoid those crowds. And I, I sometimes think that's like the multi-resort lift passes. That's sometimes one of the best things that you can do. Um, so, for example, um, Diableray and Laison are only about half an hour's drive from each other. And I went to Diableray and I looked at the queue for the gondola and I thought, nah, not today. I got back in the car, drove the half an hour, and then I had a nice day at Laison and Le Charette where I didn't see anyone. So um, if you've got the freedom to do that, and you can be a bit more flexible, you can hopefully avoid those crowds. Can I ask how much how much planning went into that that trip as a whole? And like, like, how did you actually go about organizing everything beforehand? Was there was there a lot of things that you remained flexible on? Or, or was everything kind of like fixed and planned out ahead before you arrived? Uh, a little bit of both. So obviously, lift pass had to be bought quite far in advance. Um, the travel and the dates around that was pretty flexible. And then I had my first week's accommodation um, booked. And then from that, normally when I was in a ski resort, I would loosely look where are the conditions good and where should I go? Um, I guess the only other thing to say is, so simply the, my starting point was there. Sass Fay was my furthest away point, which was there. So I mm -hmm. kind of drove from there to there and then went back off. And a lot of these um, these resorts on the Magic Pass, they're just off one road. So there's basically a massive motorway. And then you can come off to the left. And you're going to go up to one ski resort and then you're going to cross that motorway and go up to the right. And then there's another four ski resorts over there. Mm -hmm. So as a road trip, it, it meant that flexibility was really possible. Um, and also really easy to navigate yeah and what about the what about the filming process can you give us a little bit of a an insight into all of that like i mean I've, i really love the the style that you do obviously you, yourself being a, a snowboarder there's i think there's presumably different sort of shots and different certain things that you can you can capture so what how was that as a process when you were out there I think the more that you film yourself, whether it's just talking um, or whether it's um, actually doing something like skiing or snowboarding, you'll see an angle that you like. And then you will then say, actually, I didn't like that. And it's a learning process, isn't it? Every single time. Mm. Um, I was lucky to have people with me who at times could film me. I started using the drone as well for the first time last winter, um, which obviously you have to be really careful if you're in a ski resort around people, yeah. but at least for those um, overview wide angle shots that give you a, a bit of perspective of the ski resort. Um, but for me, uh, I go in with a loose idea of what I want a video to be. Um, and then um and kind of bullet point the bits that I want to get through. And then on the mountain, I'll say, actually, it would look good over here. Because a lot of these places, I might be at for like two or three days. Um, so the first day might be finding locations um, or runs that I like. And then mm. the next couple of days, I might actually um, actively go out and try and film something. Mm. Do you ever find any sort of the, the, the surroundings when you're filming, like distracting? Like for me, like for me, if there's like you find that perfect quiet run, and then midway through a, mon a monologue or a speech, some pesky skier is like deliberately coming down, and then they decide to slow down and stop, and you're like, oh no. Yeah, I think my first video that I filmed was actually just saying about the magic pass. It was kind of like an introduction to it. And I was like, it's this much, it's blah, blah, et cetera, et cetera. And then this guy literally like came and skied and he just stopped exactly where I was. So obviously I was then like, right, this is really awkward. So stopped. And then he stood there for about five minutes. 
I think waiting for me to go again, I was like, well, that's not going to happen. And when he left, then I would then film it again. Yeah. Um, I'm quite fond of um, stopping in tree runs, to be honest, getting mm. a little bit further away from the piece, getting in a tree and doing a bit of chat there. But I, I don't know, you, you'll tell me, the more you do it, the more comfortable you get. Um, and you get less awkward talking to camera around people. Yeah, um, you, you, you're right. Um, I mean, I, I, I prefer to, to, to do, certainly do the, 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 the face-to-face bit, like away from people. I don't know what it is. There's definitely a bit of that, that whole like talking around people. And um, yeah, I still, it still doesn't feel like quite right doing it around. But if I'm just filming like um, visual shots, then I got no problem of it. Um, one of my with- funniest, sorry, oh. one of my funniest ones is I was in Hakuba and I just got off the ski bus. I had like a snowboard under one arm, my camera out in front of me. And I'm told just there was no one there. And then these two kids came around the corner and I thought, oh, I'll keep talking. So I kept saying what I was going to say. And just in the background, one of them turned around and goes, no one cares about your vlog, mate. <laughs> And then just kept walking, and I was like, "Yeah, fair enough." But, you know, if if you're gonna put yourself out on the internet, if you're gonna film yourself, whatever, you have to, you know, kind of expect it. But there we go. That that's probably that, that's like when when there's people around me filming. That's probably exactly what I I'm thinking they're feeling. Like they're looking at me, going, "Oh, who's this guy? He's just like talking to yeah. He's just like no one gives a crap." And, but there was there was one time actually I'm just thinking now like when I was I was doing a I think I was filming the the Revelstoke Mountain re- Resort review video and um, uh, it was super like, the visibility at the top wasn't great and so I came down below the clouds just above the mid station pulled over to the side and the thing is over here in Canada it's like the ski patrol are always doing like well they're patrolling they're always around and I just pulled off on the on the side. And the patrol guy just pulls up like right behind me. And I've like taken out all my skis. I've sat them down in an area. So I've got this whole area like fixed to do this piece. And then he's like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just uh, just doing a little bit of filming. Oh, okay. Stays there. Has a chat with someone on the walkie talkie. And like, again, you're kind of like, you don't want to be rude, but in your head, yeah. you're like, can you go away please? Well, I think um, at Kirkwood in California, they've got this um, famous run called the Wall, and at the top of it, there's like a um, uh, like a skull and crossbones, a flag. Right. And so I walked up to it, and I was getting all my angles, and I was like getting up close and getting a little bit lower and doing all of that. And then afterwards, I started talking about this is the wall, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the ski patrollers stuck their head out because they they got a patrol hat at the top, and he was like. I hope you survive so you can edit the video. I was just, <laughs> just like, okay, thank you. But you you got to take him a pinch of salt and laugh, I think. Yeah, of course, mate, definitely. Um, but going back to the thing you said on the drones, that was one thing I was going to point out that I loved about some of those videos from Switzerland. Like, um, I mean, the, the, the really gave you a, like a, a different viewpoint and a, and a sense of the, the landscape of some of those resorts. I mean, drone shots always look cool, but actually, the, the fact that you had such like clear blue weather really like brought it out even more. Um, but I'm curious to know how how you were allowed to do that. Did you have to get any permission or anything like that? Uh, well, no. There's places you can fly it, and there's places you can't fly it. Yeah. Um, and normally, like a notification comes up on your screen. So, I think I remember taking it out at one location in Grimentz. Mm. And uh, this little dialogue box popped up and it was like, if you're going to fly your drone here, you have to um, basically state that you're okay to pay the fine. And I can't remember exactly what the fine was, like if you caused any damage, like you had to be able to pay damages up to 10 million euros or 10 million Swiss francs. Mm. And I was like, "Uh, no, I think I'll put it away. Um, (laughs) So as long as there was no warning came up, then, then I used it and I made sure that, you know, I wasn't around people. Um, yeah. I think that's, that's the main concern, isn't it? That you're going to fly it into people. And I think for a lot of the drone shots that I use, it's normally just a wide little view of the resort, a little bit of movement. And the other thing, obviously skiing, uh, if you're filming in a resort lifts, trying to keep it away from lifts and wires, 
Um, mm. So it's only normally a little bit at the start of the day or after I finish skiing, I might go out and yeah. um, and put it up. But yeah, not I'm not going to risk it. But for Revelstoke, it's the helicopters you've got to watch out for. Um, wow. A couple of weeks back, I did I did um, I sort of vol- volunteered to to star in a video um at the, with the resort where they were they were basically doing a bit of a marketing push to just announce one of their hiking trails had opened for the summer and um it was so the the, the guy had had a one of the, the sort of the big drones and i was observing him because i was curious because i am considering maybe at some point investing in like a starter a starter drone but his was like you know had the full works and on his thing had the it had the map because Revelstoke's got an airport um, and mostly helicopters, but in the summer we get a lot of firefighting crews come through there and water planes. And it just, you know, there's a circumference around the airport where you don't go, but then there's a bit around there that it that is allowed. Um, and it's a similar thing, I think, kind of to what you you mentioned you had to go through, but I think you do have to, somehow on the app, you've got to sign something that actually says, hey, I'm, I'm, telling you that i'm filming here today so i think i think for me my understanding is that it has to be in your eyesight Mm. like his drone will be different because obviously his is a commercial drone and he'll have different licenses etc um but it has to be within your eyesight and like i don't even risk that at all but just because although i i find them easy to maneuver and like i've never lost one etc even when I'm out doing my walking videos here in um, in the UK, I like to keep it close just because you never know what's going to happen. And, and it's an expensive bit of kit and maybe I'm, I'm not brave enough with it yet. Yeah. But um, I think mine is like it's one gram underneath the weight that you would need to declare stuff for. Is, um, is, is yours the, the, the Mavic Mini? Mavic Mini 2, yeah. yeah. So it's just underneath all, a lot of the regulations, I think. Yeah. But I like it because, uh, especially in a ski jacket, I can have the drone in one uh, pocket and I can have the controller in the other pocket. And I, like, you don't need to bring a big bag or anything. It's perfect for, for what I use it for. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's bring it back a little bit quickly to the, to the Magic Pass. Um, I think, did you say it was Grimmins that's your favorite destination? Grimmens, yeah. Right. So it's twinned with a ski resort called Zinal, um, and they're linked by um, a cable car. Um, but some of the off-piste in those areas is is fantastic. Yeah. I think uh, Zinal's got like a, a free ride zone, um, which is basically just left. Um, you have to basically go through a gate, and you just and you just say, "Yeah, I'm I'm okay to to go in there." Um, I remember like the the first time I went there because there's like a long pommer um, drag lift to take you to the top, and I like fell off as I got to the top, like just because like I was laughing like, and um, I, I fell off, and then when I went to go into the zone, the lifty was like, "You can't go in there. You're not good enough to go in there." And I was like, "No, honestly, please don't judge me by that. Um, that that was just like having a laugh, and I apologise, yeah. but like yeah, um, but that free ride zone's like." such good uh, terrain and to be accessible pretty much by a lift mm-hmm. ideal yeah and then if you go back over to grimmens mm-hmm. pretty much every lift you go off within either directly of the lift or a short walk mm-hmm. there is a brilliant bit of off paste yeah. um so i would highly recommend those two mm-hmm. okay um let's move on a little bit i mean you brought it up in regards to Switzerland about the cost situation. And we were just actually talking about it before, before we hit the record about just general, general costs for things coming ahead to this winter. And obviously there's a cost of living crisis going on pretty much everywhere in the world right now. And, and you were just telling me some of the costs that you've noticed for this winter and just how much they've gone up. Well, yeah, I mean, for me, I was looking at a pass that would cover other places in the world, so like Canada, America, um, and some summer skiing as well, so like mm. Australia, um, with the idea of doing that. But I also had to choose a pass that had the backups of being able to ski in Europe, yeah. um, because 
I, d I wasn't sure what was going to happen. And I think within the last month or so, the flights that I were looking at, because two of the resorts on the Epic Pass that I was hoping to visit this year were Fernie and Kicking Horse. So flights to Calgary, you could have got them for about £400. Um, but I think within the past month or couple of weeks, they're now looking at seven, eight hundred pounds, um, which just seems like a, an absolutely massive jump. And it's the same with um, going over towards Vancouver side because um, you can ski in Whistler on the Epic Pass. Yeah. And, and I was looking at that and that was about four hundred pounds. And now mm. that's a lot more for, for the dates that I was looking at. So I think flights have gone through the roof and I assume that's related to the cost of fuel or um, what like at least in the UK, I don't know what Canada's like, but what we're experiencing with cars at the moment, because um, that's gone through the roof. Here in Canada, I mean, things generally are pretty expensive. Um, everything, I mean, certainly out here in Revelstoke, things like your daily stuff, like your, your food and your food, they do cost more because I think it, there's, this, there's a, a large cost of that, of transporting it out here to somewhere that's five hours from Vancouver, uh, same amount really from from Calgary and you know Kelowna being the being the nearest hub um yeah and and obviously the Ukraine war um definitely at the height of the summer had, at some at one point regular gas as we call it or unlead unleaded fuel was it was two dollars most of the places were selling it at about two dollars twenty a uh, a gallon i think i think is what they they, they measure it in out here um but luckily things like that are starting to come down but yeah it's um it, it's it's a weird one to to measure from the outside because actually not you know the the percentage of uk people who come out here certainly to revelstoke is um i mean it's not within sort of the top three for us it's americans and australians from from overseas who are the, who are the most that come over but um, that, like you touched on, like going from four hundred to seven hundred, that's a that's a big hike. Yeah, it's and okay, you can make the argument that maybe you know should have booked earlier, all that sort of stuff. But mm. um, if it was going to go up, I wasn't expecting that. And I guess the other thing, which I I guess is a positive um, for the cost this winter, is I did something new for the first time. So normally, um, when I book accommodation, I would go to your booking.coms, your Agodas, lots of other search comparison sites are available. Yeah. Um, but I would go to one of them, find my accommodation or my Airbnb, and I would book it through them. Um, now, I had a look this year for, for my accommodation for Andermatt, and I just thought, do you know what? I'm going to ring them up. So I just rang the hotel direct, um, and they were able to apply like a, a big discount to it. So sometimes just asking that question um, can make a big difference because what I am finding is stuff this year is tending to cost more than it has done in the past. Yeah, that that's a really interesting um, thing that you pointed out, and I, I mean, what what I think, I mean, sometimes going on like a Booking dot com or this type of thing, <coughs> people, people might think that you're getting the best rate, but then you've got to realise that sites like that have a have a have a margin that they have to you know there's a profit mar margin that they probably set on each of their bookings that they need to make from it whereas yeah. like actually if you go directly to the accommodation provider they might have a totally different um you know rate on book before this a certain time um and yeah if anybody's kind of like thinking you know the next few weeks are probably going to be the last sort of best rates you're going to get before everything hikes up again in the run into winter yeah i think so um and i do find actually i don't know what you found in the past but i think booking early um has always been better like i i don't think i've ever found a last minute deal that has been as good as what i could have got it for mm. so I, I tend to try and get a trip idea in my head and as long as i've got the money and i can afford it at the time I would rather just book it then and say, right, well, that's the rate. Um, the only other thing, I guess, for, for this winter um, was the cost of the, the multi-resort pass, um, yeah. which actually um, is over double um, what I spent on the Magic Pass from last year. But I, I hope it's going to yeah. be good value. 
but if that gives you access to 50 odd resorts i mean that's it's 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 huge it's huge value um i think for what you're for what you, you you are actually paying um and i mean we were also talking about this before before we we were recording but like i think it's a it's a very unique way of actually going and exploring the mountains via a multipass like a lot of certainly like a lot if you're a, if you're doing a family trip you're probably going to stick to one location but if you're a solo skier or you know maybe you have a group of you know people who 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 are of a very good quality and you want to really sort of get a, a, a unique way of experiencing the skiing then yeah yeah it's something to look into would you agree yeah definitely and it depends what you want to get out of it because and also it, a lot of places so say um so i'm using the epic pass this coming winter um, mm -hmm. which was 729 pounds right i think the last time that i had it i went with um a couple of friends to the free valleys in france yeah and for the four days that we were there i think they paid about 300 euros for their for their four days it was somewhere between 250 and mm. 300 euros now i then used that pass to go to italy for a week i then went to california for three weeks mm -hmm. and if it hadn't been for covid i had a trip to um, japan and a trip to australia which was all on the same pass yeah um so if you are going to go for three weeks, I think during the winter. So I know a lot of people who will go out with their family at Christmas and they'll go out with their family at Easter. If you're going to do that, that's four weeks of the school holidays, then you're probably going to save money um, with something like the Epic Pass. Are there any other benefits to these sort of multi resort passes than just giving you access to these resorts? You get discounts. To be honest, I, I haven't even used them. So I think like if you go and visit the um, the cafeteria or like uh, the restaurants in one of those resorts, you normally get a discount. If you're going into the shops to get mm. um, any merch, you're going to get a discount. Um, I think it gives me some sort of structure as well, which I know I could just structure myself, but I'm like, okay, well for this year, this is my list of resorts that I can choose from, yeah. which then narrows down, down my choices. And for me this year, it was between, um, epic and icon which icon i haven't used before and i was really keen to use um it's a little bit more than the epic pass but for me epic pass this year they added andermatt um in switzerland as unlimited access mm. whereas all of their other um i think it's 26 ski resorts that you can access in europe there's like a limited amount of days Right. But now you could go to Andermatt with the Epic Pass and ski for the whole season, yeah. which a actually is cheaper than the Andermatt season pass. Mm. And then okay. you can. So if you were if you were planning on going to Switzerland and skiing Andermatt for a lot of time, you're actually better off to buy the Epic Pass than you are to buy the actual season pass, which yeah. is like mind blowing. So I think like one of the things that's that's like keen to point out with what we're discussing here is like for anybody who's interested by these is like actually do some digging into the benefits like if you've got the free the flexibility and you can afford to to, to buy something like this like you know really look into it because each each of these one of these passes is a little bit different like i i know there are other passes in in europe like i know the you've mentioned the magic pass but i know the super ski card in austria is it, yeah. it gives you a, a huge amount of access to terrain and that's something one day which i've i've always said i'd love to kind of do over here in um you mentioned the icon pass we have th things as well like the the mountain collective which uh again loads of resorts on the on the sort of the northwest here gives you two free days here at revelstoke and then 50 percent off any further um, lift tickets based on the day rate at the resort and then yeah things like discounts off retail and food and we've got something as well here called a called a vertical card and a vertical card is um it's it, it's something which is only for residents living on the west coast and we have either a three day a five day or a 10 day card and you can buy these and certainly the, the the first few definitely depending on the, on when you can buy them obviously 
but like the three day would be cheaper than actually if you were buying three consecutive days of skiing at the resort whereas with the vertical card it gives you complete flexibility so let's say if you were li let's say you're living down in Kelowna which is two and a half hours away and your normal resort you might go to might be some peaks but a couple of times a year you'd like to venture up to Revelstoke you could buy a three-day vertical card and you can ski any three of those days during the season same thing with a five-day or a ten-day that's really good and, and i think the fact that they're allowing that for for locals it's going to attract more people because yeah okay people come from abroad but i think ski resorts need to get their locals in every single year because they're the the lifeblood of the community aren't they so yeah. being able to offer them the chance to maybe step away from that ski resort that they go to on a yearly basis and just mm. try another one yeah. you might nick nick a couple of people the challenge the challenge for here with that is that it's certainly the transport um i mean that it's, it's very limited actually i had someone on the phone yesterday who because obviously we've got this airport here and, and someone said to me look do they fly commercial into into revelstoke now i know a couple of years ago they used to from vancouver with a you know a small prop plane but then i think in the end it wasn't very profitable and there's no um actual what do they call it sort of uh measurement of machinery actually stuff at, at the the resort so like you could base, you'd be basically flying blind into a valley trying to actually land at revelstoke um and train wise it's only freight trains there's no commer there's no like public train services or anything like that i think at all across large parts of canada which is crazy and I just keep thinking, you know, because there's two or three resorts down in the Okanagan. And if you had a, you know, if you had a system from there through to Revelstoke and on to, uh, you know, sort of Calgary with Banff and everything was it, it take an enormous amount of people off the road. But instead, people chance it driving up these roads where there could be avalanches and like, you know, some of those passes can be closed for hours, if not days. So the Revelstoke's on the icon, isn't it? It is on the icon, yeah. And I think um, Banff, so the free ski resorts of Sunshine, Lake Louise and Norquay, and you get yeah. seven days there because that's a trip that I've looked at. And it's interesting you bringing that up in terms of the transport because in my head I was like, well, yeah, you've got to drive. Um, but I guess the fact that that will probably limit some people in getting to Revelstoke probably yeah. makes it more special because mm. it's not overcrowded. Just don't ever fly into Calgary if you're looking to come here, Simon, um, because to do that, you have, I mean, before snowstorms and everything, it's a five hour drive. You have to come over Rogers Pass. Now, if anybody who's been over Rogers Pass knows, um, it's, it's hugely um, large amounts of avalanches during the winter. Um, I think this year we had roughly 20 to 25 avalanches within there. So that thing can get shut down. And, you know, if you're getting a transfer from there, nearest airport, it's far better to fly into Kelowna and do it that way. You get a transfer, which is only about two and a half hours to Revelstoke. So, um, yeah, if you, you are coming out to Canada, uh, Simon, fly into there, trust me. Okay, good to know. Definitely <laughs> make a note of that. Yeah. And then I, I think like the, the only other thing that's really different about the Epic and the Icon, they both offer like, unlimited skiing in north america yeah. um which is a good good thing but if you did want to use one in the summer yeah icon gives you a week at um the remarkables and coronet peak it gives you um a week at fred bow or mount buller um but epic will give you unlimited skiing in australia mm. at perisher hotham and falls creek so it, it depends on what what you're looking for whether you're wanting more unlimited or you're happy to just go week here week here week here yeah because you've done new zealand have you done australia yes yeah, so i worked a season at fred bow in australia okay um and yeah i went in their worst snow year for 50 years huh. um and i had a really really good time so people who and in fact one of my friends um went to instruct their or what would it have been it would have been maybe one or two years before covid um mm. and he um is based in the port de soleil during uh, our winters um and he loved it as well so i think w they're smaller resorts i think fred is like 600 meters vertical drop um yeah. perisher is half of that um but you're on snow you can have a great time yeah 
Well, let's 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 bring it back to this coming winter, though. Um, yeah. Because you've mentioned you've 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 got one trip definitely booked in, which is Andamat. Is that right? Yes, Andamat um, is the one that I've booked so far, and in all honesty, that was the reason that I went for the Epic Pass because I thought if there is unlimited skiing in Europe on a season pass, then I'll definitely go to there. And if I can't get across to North America or even Japan, um, because they're still, I think, closed to tourists at the moment, um, then at least there's that option there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, your sort of your Switzerland adventures, mate. Like I said, like they they are pretty, yeah, pretty like it's spectacular to witness. And I, I think I'm, am I right as well? It, it kind of you you got quite a bit of um, attention from it, didn't you? Because you were on a couple of podcasts and. Um, <laughs> um yeah i was i was able to go to um uh the the ski podcast live um at the nec that mm. was before the season started but to discuss what i what i was going to do um and then go back on it through through the season just to update them yeah. um ian martin um the guy who uh, runs the ski podcast he loves andamat and i think he's done a lot of ski touring there um, so it was already somewhere that was kind of in the back of my mind as a place to go. Yeah. And then this announcement came up from like Vale Resorts who own Epic that like we have purchased a ski resort in Switzerland uh, and everyone was kind of speculating, is it Verbier? Is it this place? Is it this place? And then when it came out as Andermatt, I was like, well, there you go. Got to go. Yeah. I'm, I, I, it's it's funny you mentioned Vale because I was – I was trying to figure out how do I bring in Vale Resorts as a subject into the Epic Pass thing because um, I don't know whether you followed it at all, but last yeah. winter, I mean, there was there was a lot of controversy around Vale Resorts and their treatment of staff. Yeah, I think have have they made? I don't think they've made amends, but they've made steps towards treating their staff better. Yeah, but so. Um, well, I mean, yeah, it wasn't just the staff, I think, that they, they annoyed. There was obviously the customers, but, yeah, a lot of long, long-standing long staff. And, you know, they, they they are probably the biggest, I guess, ski resort conglomerate, shall we say, in the in, in the in the business right now, just because they own so many. Um, yeah, they have things like the Icon Pass, but with everything going on from from covid and 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 whatnot last year i mean i don't think their operations were at a hundred percent but yeah and a lot of a lot of staff revolts around the issue of pay um i do know coming out of the winter after their share price dropped a bit i think um they then sort of announced a flat minimum wage for everyone at work flat minimum wage of twenty dollars an hour um which I don't know how that's reverberated around thing, but I think it certainly set a precedent, especially with going back to the cost situation a bit for for staff. You know, ski resorts, ski season jobs don't often pay well, and there's a lot of things that people knew. It's so I think what they've done there is sort of gone some way to try and fix it, but whether or not they're going to actually operate these resorts at full capacity is another thing. I think they've set a limit actually at Vale on how many people per day they were going to allow at the resort. That's interesting. Because I think, I heard... I th- I think a lot of last winter was all based around staffing, wasn't it? Um, yeah. A lot of foreign staff who would go and work for their resorts weren't able to go for various reasons, which then meant local recruitment had to increase. And obviously mm. not all resorts were successful in doing that. Um, I think because I have had the Epic Pass before. It's a weird one because I I know locals don't really like it anyway because Epic Pass buys your resort. It then brings people like me or more likely other um, North Americans who are like, oh, actually, we could go for a week over at Heavenly, whereas before you might not have done. Mm. So I think it has increased crowds and the price of it, um, you can see why, because if it's cheaper than like a season pass, but you're actually getting, you know, access to 30, 40, 50 resorts. Yeah. Um, It's a weird one, the balance, isn't it? Because you don't want to like take Revel State where you are at the moment. I know they're under Icon, but if a big, um, they're only on a seven day Icon, are they? So like you're allowed seven days access? Um, 
something like that. But there are, depending on which icon pass you've got, I mean, there are blackout dates. Okay. So, like, if 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 they said, right, we're going to have unlimited access to Revelstoke, yeah. then Revelstoke would probably get overrun by icon pass holders who want to make the most out of it. Mm. And it's... It, that is that good for the local community don't know so it's all in moderation isn't it but it is nice because i was following it on twitter i'm happy that obviously vale are going to treat their staff better because you want to um you want to support products and, and businesses that are doing the right thing they also have like quite a bad reputation of just dealing with skiers like i don't know if you saw um is it that Jonathan Buckhouse, his video went absolutely viral. Like he got um, pulled over by slope patrol or whatever they're called because, you know, he was going too fast and yes, safety is important, but then coming into safety, I would argue that some people have the ability to ski or snowboard faster than others and still be in control. And, you know, he had to go and do like the equivalent of like a driving yeah. s- speeding yep. test or whatever. I remember, um, I remember watching that video. Yeah, you had to take like a speed test. Yeah, so like that they have a <laughs> they have quite a bad reputation in in a lot of ways. Yeah, um, and I think I'm just trying to skirt around the outside of that and just be like, what positives can I take from it, and what will they do for me during my winter? And what that means is unlimited skiing at lots of places. And also, hopefully, my big yeah. plan for this year will be um, five to six weeks snowboarding in Australia the coming summer. So uh, for gonna, that, yeah. Yeah, so I was, I was going to just say, because we are, we are just going to have to sort of start wrapping it up here. But my, my sort of final thing to you was, you know, what, what, what really can people look forward to seeing on, on your channel this coming winter? So hopefully, um, lots of lots of snowboarding in new resorts, places that I'm going to for the first time. During the times that I'm not snowboarding, I'm here in a beautiful place in the UK, in the Lake District. I've been able to ski here, so I'm um, getting out on my split board um, and getting up into the local fells if the conditions are good enough. I would love to get across the border into Scotland this year and um, again take the split board. And besides from that, if I'm not snowboarding, I'll be um, walking up and trying to complete my Wainwrights project, um, which is to try and scale. I think it's all 214 of um, the Wainwrights here in the local area. So um, lots to look forward to. And uh, yeah, excited to get on with it. Yeah, no, um, I mean, that's, that sounds jam packed. Um, I would love to come up back up to the Lake District and have you show me around the uh, the Hell Val and Lake District ski ski resort, as it were, um, at some point. But um, you're more than welcome. Yeah. Um, listen, Simon, thank you though for for taking the time to to come on today. It's been really great to sort of catch up with you, touch base, and uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm like even more excited for the winter now than it was an hour ago. Hundred percent. I'm excited uh, to see your winter, what Revelstoke brings, and uh, yeah, hopefully I'll be able to get as many trips in as possible. But thanks for having me, and uh, yeah, we'll catch up soon. I'm sure. No worries. Thanks very much, Simon. Uh, so thanks very much, guys, for watching today's slope talk. Um, yeah, like I said at the start, it's been a bit of a while, but uh, great to catch up again with a friend of the channel, Simon, and discuss a lot of issues actually today and um, we've kind of not stopped talking covering his his journey on to switzerland on the magic pass we kind of flew really through that on the discussion of multi multi-resort passes went on to discussing the epic pass a lot of bit of a discussion around the cost of uh winter of this coming year and then his plans heading back to switzerland and possibly down under Um, But I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, by all means, like this video and subscribe to the channel. Any questions you have for Simon or myself, please put them in the comments and we will get back to those in due course. But until next time, thanks for watching.